Throughout history, angels have been depicted as winged, beautiful creatures who live in heaven alongside God, and pride themselves on helping humanity. They are supposed to be good and powerful creatures, however, not all of this is true. Some angels are fallen, become demons in the process, whereas others don't have much care for humanity at all, and will stop at nothing to destroy. These are the top five angels you're glad aren't real. Let's jump in. Coming in at number five, we have Angels of Paradiso. Hailing from the Bayonetta game series, the Angels of Paradiso are angels who appear marble-like with gold and ivory armor, and golden halos made of light. The angels that are often seen by humanity appear humanoid, closely resembling modern depictions of angels. However, others are more exotic. Higher ranks appear as ships or even cars, and other angels appear as angelic beasts. Most angels are able to influence the human world, with some of them even breaking free of physical bonds completely, allowing them to manipulate their physical form at will, and mimic Bayonetta's weapons and even her attacks, creating some truly powerful opponents. The angels of Paradiso are the main antagonists of the series and they will stop at nothing to ensure their victory against the human population in the process. You may think it odd that Bayonetta wants to fight angels, but at the end of the day these angels wish to destroy her. They care very little for humanity and only wish to see themselves succeed. These are the nastiest kind of angels, ones which don't follow the typical ideals of angels we used to seeing depicted throughout history. Before we jump into number four, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, it really helps us out a lot. The YouTube algorithm pushes our content out there more, pushes me out there more. And if you like me and you like top five, support us. Coming in at number four, we have Belial, also known as the King of Evil. Belial is the 68th spirit of the Goetia, and one of the four princes of hell ruling over the north. Belial is said to be a mighty and powerful king, being created right after Lucifer, and existing in his order. Looks-wise, he is a beautiful angel, often depicted sitting in a chariot of fire. However, he was one of the angels against God and heaven, and was ultimately cast out, and now resides in the depths of hell, eventually going on to be part of the Stygian Council and becoming a king of hell. Belial governs 80 legions of spirits and whoever summons this fallen angel must have offerings of gifts and sacrifices or he will not meet their demands. He is the demons of lies and guilt and is capable of inducing any type of sins, especially those related to sex and lust. His name can be translated to the Lord of Arrogance or the Lord of Pride and is often associated with immoral, atheists and magicians and known for going against the grain. Now, despite not being as powerful or as terrifying as Lucifer, Belial is a foreboding demon who fell from heaven and you're gonna be glad he isn't real, that's for sure. Coming in at number three, we have Lucifer. Now it comes as no surprise that Lucifer has a place on our list, and he is perhaps the most famous fallen angel who now resides in the depths of hell. Also known in some texts as Satan, the devil, light bringer, or even light bearer, Lucifer was one of the earliest of God's creations and the younger brother of Michael. He was often regarded as wise, great, and one of the most beautiful of the creations. However, when he rebelled against God and heaven, he was cast out and down to the depths of hell after causing the downfall of mankind. Now Lucifer was said to be a to predestination, a concept that describes destiny of all beings being under God's will and command. He began to view God as a tyrannical leader and declared that all people should be allowed to be in control of their own lives and their own destinies. Honestly, preach. <laughs> when he was banished out of heaven, it was said that Lucifer fell for days. I quote, nine times the space that measures day and night. It is said that when he finally stopped falling, his collision turned the lake of fire into the very constructs of hell. His appearance changed drastically with his wings being burned off and mutating into red bat-like wings. Now, Lucifer is as evil as they come. There's a reason his name and Satan's are often interchangeable. He is said to be a celestial power commanding the legions of hell, including its lords. When provoked, he uses fire as a weapon and to quote Lucifer himself, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. I'll see you there, Lucifer. I'll be in hell too. Coming in at number two, we have the cherubim. A cherub doesn't sound all that terrible. They are often depicted throughout history as relatively cute and often seen flying around with a bow and arrow. However, these angels aren't as sweet as you might think. A cherub is one of the unearthly beings who directly attend to God, according to Abrahamic religions. In the book of Ezekiel, the cherub is depicted as having two pairs of wings and four faces, that of a lion, an ox, a human, and an eagle. Very creepy indeed. The appearance of these creatures often being described as burning coals of fire. Definitely not how most people are used to seeing them, which is often depicted in works of art as giant babies flying around with smiles on their faces. The description of each cherub in the book of Ezekiel gets even more bizarre, with them being accompanied by half-machine, half-creature concoctions called wheels. They are enormous in size and covered in eyes, with them looking like a villain straight out of Hellboy. Now, cherubim are starting to sound quite terrifying, right? It makes a whole lot of sense why artists decided to paint cherubim 
cherub and more like Cupid, then paint them how they actually are, which are straight up monsters that look more like demons than angels. And finally coming in at number one, we have Weeping Angels. Hailing from the Doctor Who universe, the Weeping Angels are a race of predatory creature, first introduced in the 2007 episode Blink, although I think they may have been introduced earlier, I'm not sure. I know this much because it's the only episode of Doctor Who I've ever watched and it stars the utterly charming Carrie Mulligan. She's all that could draw me in. Now the Weeping Angels are quantum locked humanoids that are capable of moving vast distances in just the blink of an eye. Now they don't outright kill their victims, but they do have the ability to feed on their energy of their unlived days. Despite nobody quite knowing where these Weeping Angels come from, the Doctor describes them as, I quote, the deadliest, most powerful, most malevolent life form evolution has ever produced. How terrifying is that? With just a single touch, a Weeping Angel can send a person into their past and all the way back to their birth, with the Doctor also stating that they are perhaps the only psychopaths in the universe to kill you nicely, <laughs> simply because their victims go uninjured and may live out long lives in the past. It is said that Weeping Angels have the power to turn ordinary statues into angels, with this being shown when the Statue of Liberty becomes one. It is also said that the kiss of a Weeping Angel has numerous effects, including transforming the kissed person into a duplicate of other people. Their kiss also has the ability to drain a person of their life energy, ultimately reducing them to dust. These sinister creatures are almost impossible to avoid, however victims have succeeded in the past by winking rather than forcing their eyes open and not blinking. This is how the 10th Doctor, David Tennant, avoided them during World War One. Coming in at number five, we've got God's Angels from Legion. You know that old notion of a kind and loving God? Well, that's not happening in this movie. No siree. Apparently at some point around 2010, God gave up on humanity and said, it. We've done the whole dividing up of languages so nobody can understand each other. We've done the worldwide flood for a hard reset. What's the way we're going to take down humanity this time? Ah, that's right. Heavenly warfare against folks that have a snowflake's chance in hell of surviving. That is the premise of Legion. God is pissed, so he sends his angelic armies to kill every human on earth. That is bleak. And they're not like raising people with arrows of light or rapturing up folks real high and then dropping them down. They are stepping right up to the citizens of Earth and tearing them to pieces. It is not a pretty sight. Of course, we kick it all off with an insane grandmother letting a pregnant mom know her baby's gonna burn in hell. She then proceeds to bite a gaping hole in a man's neck and climb all over the walls like a geriatric Spider-Man. Hot start. While that may be the scariest thing that happens here, we've got horde after horde of terrifying angels ready to rain hellfire upon a dusty diner in the middle of nowhere. The winged warriors descend upon this tiny town like swarms of locusts, tearing up anything they can. There are also actual locusts too, just in case you're worried. It is an insurmountable challenge to face down these creatures while keeping humanity's last hope, an unborn child, alive, but Archangel Michael descends to Earth to make it happen. It's a blood pumping action movie with plenty of horrific scenes. What's not to love? Plus there's that classic bit with the sketchy ice cream man. God, what an image. The wide mouthed, spindly limbed dude in a yellow uniform scuttling towards you at top speed. Isn't exactly a movie meant to be taken seriously, but boy, is it fun. Coming in at number four, we've got the guardian angel from a dark song. In the end, this angel did do exactly what it was supposed to do, but all the stuff that led up to its appearance was harrowing. Plus, let's be real, summoning a guardian angel through torture and bloodshed and then having it smite your enemies doesn't seem like something a holy and good person would do. If you're unfamiliar with a dark song, we'll summarize it now. After losing her young son, a grieving widow decides to rent a secluded house in Wales. She spends her time there alone, dealing with great sorrow. However, she's got an ulterior motive for being there. She wants to convince a famous occultist to guide her through a ritual to allow her to speak to her son once more. This requires the summoning of a guardian angel who will somehow bring her son's spirit to her. Now, The ritual requires a whole lot of commitment, and that the two stay indoors the entire time. This sounds like a recipe for disaster, and it is. The occultist is a bit of a skis ball, and after the mother refuses to perform a rite of forgiveness, among other things, things go a little sideways. They manipulate and each other for a while, but fall into some daily routines and become familiar over time. However, the mother has been keeping a secret. She hasn't been totally honest and is really performing the ritual to get revenge on the person who kidnapped and killed her son. So whenever this angel comes, it won't be one of forgiveness and healing. It will be an angel of vengeance and death. Yikes. 
With this realization, things get a whole lot worse. To summon this angel, the mother must be killed and reborn, and the occultist sustains a festering wound. Demons begin to infest the house and drive the mother to madness. But in the end, the angel does indeed appear, both glorious and horrifying. But was it worth it? Well, I suppose that's up to the viewer. Would you be able to muster up the strength to forgive the person who killed your child after a life-altering ordeal? That's a tough one. Coming in at number three, we've got Gabriel from The Prophecy. If Christopher Walken playing the role of an evil angel waging a war against God doesn't get you to watch a movie, uh, I don't know what to tell you. This 1995 religious thriller launched a whole series of sequels, all concerning Archangel Gabriel's many issues with the way things are being run up top. In this flick, Gabriel is full of tricks, malice, and violence. When an angel can descend from heaven and steal souls from evil individuals to turn the tide of a celestial war, you'd better watch out. He's just so perfectly creepy as he slinks around, mercilessly killing people and attempting to kidnap children. Gabriel does not shy away from torture, nor does he feel the slightest bit bad, stealing the souls of people to push his own goals forward. All because God didn't listen to him more. Although that arrogance would eventually be his downfall, he caused a whole lot of chaos in his brief time on earth, and had he succeeded, heaven would have become a second hell. Now isn't that a terrifying proposition? Coming in at number two, we've got the fallen angels from Gabriel. We just talked about Gabriel the character in another movie, now we're going to talk about Gabriel the movie. In a post-apocalyptic vision of heavenly warfare, we enter purgatory, which is now corrupted by evil. This forces it to take on the form of a seedy, rundown city where angels and fallen angels must take the forms of humans to exist. This exposes them to human faults and desires. These traits prove much more damaging to angels over time as the fallen angels gain strength from all that debauchery. At times, it's easy to forget that you're watching a movie about angels at all. In the rundown city, every vice possible is there and super exploited. It hinges on absurdity at times, to be honest. These angels and fallen angels indulge in every possible vice and do it to the extreme. We've got angels living in the back of broken down buses, drinking themselves to death. We've got beautiful angels being drugged and employed at brothels. There are people being forcibly given plastic surgery to look exactly like their vain captors and then used as slaves. There are nightclubs full of synthetic drugs to placate and pacify powerful deities. The world is richly imagined, don't get me wrong, and feels like something straight out of an edgy 80s comic book, but these angels and fallen angels hanging out in purgatory are definitely not ones you want to cross, lest you end up a personal pleasure servant or a junkie in a back alley. And finally at number one, we've got Angels from Jacob's Ladder. Before the 1990 horror gem and even before the popular carnival climbing game, Jacob's Ladder was essentially a stairway to heaven detailed in religious texts. Originally cited in a dream by biblical patriarch Jacob, it has been used as a symbol for ascension and more. This vision is very different from what Jacob Singer sees in the movie movie, but there are many parallels here. After returning from war, Jacob starts experiencing terrifying visions in his day to day life. He reaches out to fellow veterans who seem to be having similar experiences. However, the visions intensify and Jacob has trouble separating these supposed hallucinations from reality. Is it that he and his comrades were experimented on by the military, or were they experiencing mental issues before even being cleared for combat? Could it be that these visions are visions from angels, similar to the biblical Jacob's? There's a scene in the movie where a 14th century Christian mystic Meister Eckhart is quoted. He says, The only thing that burns in hell is the part of you that won't let go of life. Your memories, your attachments, they burn them all away. But they're not punishing you, they're freeing your soul. So if you're frightened of dying and you're holding on, you'll see devils tearing your life away. But if you've made your peace, then the devils are really angels, freeing you from the earth. So could these terrifying visions that are slowly degrading Jacob down to nothing actually be angels? It's hard to say, especially when we also learn that Jacob's unit was secretly drugged with a substance meant to increase aggression before heading into combat. So maybe Jacob really was dead the whole time, feeling the effects of the drug leave his body as his life also fades away. Or maybe his death meant that he had to wrestle with angels and demons before being able to move on. Coming in at number 5, we've got Abizathibu. Fallen angels tend to have pretty wild names, so we'll kick off with a good one. Abizathibu. 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 Keep saying it, I swear. 
way or nothing bad will happen. While some angels fall from heaven and just chill in the sacrilege paradise that is hell, some have higher hopes for sure. Good old Abizathibu is one of those with goals. Aspirations, a day planner fully loaded with terrible tasks. After following Beelzebub in a grand exit from the Holy Land, he became quite an important demon in hell. Most hell dwellers choose to follow a certain demon or become part of a legion of some sort. This fallen angel has control over all sorts of imprisoned souls. Some say that this charge is both a privilege and a burden though, but I would imagine the same is true of all sorts of tasks in hell. There's much more to this demon though. He doesn't just remain in hell for all of eternity. In fact, there's a wild story about what Abyssithibu got up to above ground. After falling from heaven, he roamed about Egypt, eventually causing a pharaoh's heart to harden. This act of evil inspired the pharaoh to pursue the fleeing Israelites, which ended poorly to say the least. This pursuit resulted in the pharaoh's army being crushed by the Red Sea. Abizathibu himself was imprisoned in a pillar of water and forced to uphold a pillar of air until a temple's completion. That has to do terrible things to one's mind, so I'm sure whenever this demon escapes, he'll be ready to wreak some vengeful havoc. You'll be able to recognize this angel turned demon rather quickly too. He has two differently colored wings. One is bright red. So if you ever come across an entity with two different colored wings, one being red, you can probably be pretty sure, re reasonably so, that it is Abizathibu. Be careful and watch yourself as he is the demon of pride known to lead people astray. Coming in number 4, we've got Furfur. Don't be fooled by the somewhat silly name on this one, Furfur is to be feared. A great Earl of Hell, he commands 29 legions of demons that can compel all sorts of atrocities to happen. Take in that his name could be a corruption of the Latin word Furcifer, which means scoundrel. We love a good scoundrel around here, but be aware that when dealing with one face to face, he will almost always come away as the loser. He's been depicted as all sorts of different things, from an angel to a fox to a winged heart, which is essentially an older species of deer, plus wings of course. In those forms, Furfur has been known to trick and mislead people as he is a pathological liar. The imagery of a tricky fox or deer has been used in myths and stories all across the world. Apparently if you compel Furfur into a magical triangle though, he will revert to his true form and speak only the truth. Whether or not you want his scratchy demonic voice telling you truths is a matter of contention though. Trickery and shape-shifting are only the beginning of this entity's power. Furfur can force love between a man and woman, which often does not result in desirable outcomes. The actual method Furfur employs to make this false love happen is up in the air, but maybe double check your intentions if you find yourself falling in love in the woods. Furfur can also whip up destructive inclement weather, enormous cracks of lightning, tremendously loud thunder, and storms with rain and wind that put monsoons to shame are all under his control. So don't make him mad lest you end up struck by lightning or drowned in torrential rainfall. If you summon this fallen angel, he may impart some knowledge upon you. Often this knowledge is of divine things and meant to instill happiness. So even though he is known as a demon, he's not all that bad. There are benefits to having him around if you can manage to avoid these storms and potential forced love. Coming at number 3, we've got Adramelech. Possibly an ex-angel, possibly a Sumerian sun god, Adramelech is worshipped by people around the world who wish to offer up sacrifices in exchange for power and wealth. Here's a fun fact, not only is he a chieftain of hell, he's also got a whole bevy of other interesting hellish responsibilities. Firstly, he's the great chancellor of demons, which is pretty neat. He's also president of the devil's general council. Who knew the demons were so democratic and well organized? But here's the kicker, my favorite fact about Adramelech. He is the governor of the devil's wardrobe. Tell me you wouldn't want some fashion tips from the devil's wardrobe governor. Some seriously killer style on this dude. Probably has one of the original pairs of Satan shoes and everything. To ensure that he looks the part, he takes on the form of either a humanoid mule or a peacock. Or maybe sometimes he's a mule-peacock hybrid. All the above are probably true in some capacity. Be warned, even if you do encounter a fabulously dressed mule peacock man, he's not to be approached. He's described as an enemy of God, greater in ambition, guile, and mischief than Satan. A fiend more cursed, a deeper hypocrite. And we hear a lot of bad things about Satan all the time. So if Andremelech is worse and more cursed than the big guy down there, then we're in for some trouble. Maybe that's why all those hardcore streetwear enthusiasts are so pure evil. They're just channeling Andremelech. Coming in at number two, we've got Andras. Now we're getting into 
into some hardcore ones. Sure, we started with some fallen angels who might have a violent tendency or two or compel people to act in ways that contradict their morals, but that's all just part of life, right? Andros is straight up evil. He is powerful, deadly evil. The Grand Marquis of Hell, 63rd of the 72 Spirits of Solomon, and commanding 30 legions of demons. Boom. If Andros likes somebody, he teaches them to kill their enemies, masters, and servants. Yeah, all, all three categories. He is a bringer of bloodbath and brings them often. Nobody escapes when he's around. To make matters worse, he also gets a kick out of creating bad situations. Sowing discord among people is a chief interest, and trouble seems to follow him wherever he goes. It's hard to avoid him too, as he does take many forms and can really mess up your day if you're not ready. See, usually magicians look to summon Andros in order to gain some of his power, but he's not easily handled. He will often kill the very people who summoned him if they're not prepared for his arrival. Then he's just free to roam around with his owl head and crazy sword, murdering to his heart's content. Not great. Usually he looks sort of human, with an owl or raven head riding a dark wolf. Very majestic, very cool, very dangerous. Seriously, watch yourself if you even catch a whiff of Andros activity. And finally at number one, we've got Beelzebub. Somebody told me he's got a devil set aside, but I'm not really sure what to make about that. There's also talk of Beelzebub being pretty wicked with the guitar and him stealing a whole lot of souls with it. This is all just hearsay, mind you, so take it with a grain of salt. However, the mythical Beelzebub, famous fallen angel, does have a lot written about him in religious and historical texts. His name means Lord of the Flies, and he rules over those nasty little buggers down in hell. A third fallen angel after Lucifer and Leviathan, Beelzebub has a lot of sway in the Lake of Fire. He's Lucifer's chief lieutenant and wears that title with pride. And speaking of pride, he's also the Demon of Pride. Also gluttony, also the Prince of False Gods. Witches love him, as they often mention him as an object of desire, and Beelzebub is a name that popped up quite a bit during the Salem Witch Trials. His presence is everywhere, and many folks blame him for all sorts of demonic possessions throughout history. Just an absolute all-star when it comes to demonic activities. No wonder he's referenced so much in literature, music, movies, and more. Boy, howdy. Who knew angels could commit to such hard pivots? There are more of these than I originally thought, especially when you delve a little deeper. Makes me wonder what the angels who are still currently being angelic are up to. Coming at number 5, we've got Belial. An absolute classic when it comes to the most evil and vile of angels, Belial has been adapted time and time again. Movies, comics, novels, songs, you name it. There's gonna be some sort of media depicting Belial as a wrathful, terrifying monster. Is he a demon? A fallen angel? Something much worse? All good questions, but really all that matters is that he's despicable. Like in the Jewish Bible, Belial is the word for wicked or worthless. He is the embodiment of wickedness. So in case you were thinking about giving good old Belial a shout, maybe reconsider. His origin story is pretty classic too. Created soon after Lucifer, Belial was one of the angels up in heaven for quite a while. However, when rumblings of a revolt started, he was ready to take up arms. Lucifer started the uprising, but Belial was not too far behind when it came to going against God. This resulted in the heavenly war folks hear so much about. Many battles were fought, often to a standstill. Belial was in charge of many legions of fallen angels, leading them into combat and even winning some battles. However, at the last moment, God decided to send Archangel Michael some backup. The assistants did indeed tip the scales and defeated Belial and his angels of destruction. However, that was just the beginning. Beginning, a prelude if you will. Because when all the fallen angels were cast out of the heavens, they started performing equally evil deeds down below. Sure, some of their powers were weakened and they could no longer wreak havoc up in the skies, but these fallen angels were mad. Real mad. Belial's influence continued from there, inspiring hatred, pestilence, and lawlessness in men. Many people who acted in such ways ended up being called sons of Belial. So if you're summoning this would-be angel, you're likely ending up in a very dark place. And don't even get me started on all the pop culture versions you could end up face to face with. My goodness, there are plenty and they are all beyond repugnant. So everyone, do me a favor and just pretend that Belial doesn't exist. Coming in number 4, we've got Raphael. Now this is a more traditionally good angel. That doesn't mean you should go around looking for a good place to summon him though. He is a hardcore dude, and one that you definitely don't want to mess with. If you're calling him down from heaven for anything short of smiting a dangerous demon, you might find yourself between a rock and a hard place. Or should I say, many rocks 
and more rocks and a hole in the ground and a bunch of fire. Yeah, we've heard this story before. Raphael doesn't take too kindly to those who might challenge the Almighty, and he does not skimp on punishment. There's that classic tale of Raphael versus Azazel in the Book of Enoch. After their epic fight, which Raphael came out on top, of course, it was time to make the demon pay the price. Raphael bound his hands and feet so he could not move and tossed him into an enormous pit of jagged rocks. Then he tumbled more rocks down upon his helpless form, burying him completely. There Azazel would wait for ages until it was time to be cast into the fires of hell. That is a hardcore punishment. Simply one example of what Raphael's willing to do, too. He's always been known as a powerful warrior, easily matching Michael and Lucifer's prowess in combat. Add in the well-regarded ability to heal, and you've got quite the angelic warrior. So while Raphael will defend heaven and heal those who need it, cross him and you could find yourself on the receiving end of a terrible punishment. Coming in at number three, we've got Asmodeus. It's funny that we're bringing up Asmodeus right after Raphael because apparently they know each other quite well. In fact, Raphael has thwarted this being many times in many different tales. Most would consider Asmodeus a demon and one that represents lust at that, but in some interpretations he is considered an angel. So for today, he fits on our list. Oh, and summoning him shouldn't be on your bucket list, okay? There are just so many reasons you don't want Asmodeus around. First and foremost, folks who fall for his trickery will find themselves spending an eternity of torment in the second level of Hell. Not fun. Just consult Dante if you want to know the details of how awful that would be. Next up, Asmodeus is just gross. He's a chimeric abomination of all sorts of creatures associated with lust. You've got chicken legs, serpent tails, multiple heads, he's riding a lion, something about a dragon, definitely some weird like man chest in there, the works. All in all, not a pleasant sight to behold. Now, there are plenty of different stories of the horrors Asmodeus brings with him, from slaying newlyweds to pulling the roofs off of homes to reveal the realities of their residence. Just a nasty angel slash demon overall. Coming in number two, we've got Moloch. Oh boy, another nasty one for the archives. Said to be the fallen angel's strongest warrior in Milton's Paradise Lost, Moloch is a very divisive figure. To some, he's a Canaanite god. To others, he's a pagan false god meant to elicit sacrifices from all involved. And to some, of course, he's a straight up demon. Whether he's a warrior for fallen angels or a sacrificial lunatic, there's no denying his influence. Often portrayed as a bullheaded figure with arms outstretched, he is associated with fire. So if you're calling upon Moloch, you're either looking to sacrifice somebody or burn them alive. And I guess a lot of the time those things can kind of be done together. Some interpretations believe that Moloch was specifically interested in sacrificing young people and that its body was actually a furnace made of bronze meant to burn their bodies. My goodness. So maybe you don't want to be calling upon this higher power. For centuries, people have reviled Moloch, claiming that any who follow him are evil heretics, looking to steal children for their own sacrificial gains. However, that hasn't prevented his followers from continuing their worship and potential burning of assorted people. Coming in number one, we've got Gabriel. We'll round out today's list with one of the best known archangels. Most folks look upon Gabriel pretty fondly. In fact, in some translations, his name literally means God is my strength. Classic angel stuff. However, if Gabriel's appearing, you'd better be on your best behavior. One thing he likes to do is permanently silence those who do not accept his presence or don't believe what he has to say. He also holds a horn meant for a very special occasion. If he were to ever play this holy instrument, it would be to announce the end of time and the beginning of the last judgment. So if you've been a God-fearing, law-abiding stick in the mud your whole life, enjoy the float up to the good life. The rest of us, Pooched. Gabriel has also been known to be a very vengeful angel with a mean streak. Look to any of those angelic horror movies from the late 90s and early 2000s and you'll see all sorts of real spooky interpretations of this figure. Really, it's a coin toss as to whether you'll get a handsome, muscular defender of man or a terrifying, decrepit specter of hatred. I'm not a big fan of option number two and I don't like option number one enough to risk it. So yeah, leave the holy beings where they are. You might revere them, but you're just a plain, boring mortal to them. Holy moly, that's a lot of scary angels and angel adjacent fiends. Usually summoning stuff goes sideways pretty fast and I can't imagine summoning an angel would be all that different. So, what'd you think of the list? Do you agree with my picks? Which angel would you summon if you had the chance? Which would you avoid at all costs? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. 
Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your more luxurious ones from the top five urban legends that deserve your attention, part two. Lock the Fox says, Keegan, I'm going to go climb a tree while being chased by direwolves and goblins. If you're going to play Dungeons and Dragons, just say so. Well, actually, I was more thinking along the lines of The Hobbit, but yeah, D&D works too. Blue Dog 79 says, Charman, I choose you. Could you imagine you're going to do like a Pokemon battle and instead of like a tiny cute creature, they toss out an entirely burned and singed human body? <laughs> Shion Akihiko says, Hannah Crana's story is totally believable. Her husband fell off a cliff, people cried witch, and she said, might as well use this to my advantage to be left in peace. It's smart since it's not like they believe any accused witches when they pled innocent. I am now a fan of Hannah Crana, may she rest in peace. Honestly, she was probably just looking for some peace and quiet in the end, and to walk around with her pet rooster without raising too many eyebrows. Hippie282 says, okay, I'm having trouble understanding how a person can be without a skull. Do they mean he has no skull and is basically just a human head? Head without shape, or do they mean he has no head? Why not say he's headless? It's a weird way to describe something. Hey, keep it up and you'll end up without a skull. And prep for it says, a great booster pack of urban legends. That's a fun way to think about it. And that's all the time we have for today. I'm going to underestimate Saitama in a fight. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. When that movie came out, like, and I was like too, too young for it, but I wanted to rent it because it looked like puppets, right? I'm like, Dad, can we get this? It's like, absolutely not. find themselves spending an eternity of torment in the second level of hell. First and foremost, folks who fall for his trickery will find themselves spending an eternity of torment in the second level of hell. Not fun. Moloch. <sighs> Moloch. In which to burn their, no, meant to in which we have a goop a toop. Let's, uh, let's try that one again. <laughs> Followers from, nope, I said devotiaries. Wow, what a fancy word. Is all sorts of assorted redundant? It's fine. It's a variety of people. A variety of people. <laughs> I like that he's just like, oh yeah, I'll take one of these, one of these. However, that hasn't prevented his devotiaries, devotiaries, devo the, 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 the. I should just say followers. A variety of people. How many people? Eh, that was a weird sentence. Can I say that? Decide, decide. <laughs>